This is a plasma spiral lamp. It uniquely visualizes one of the four fundamental forces of nature, the electromagnetic force. Now how it does that, I will get to in just a second, but first, I want to show you how I built this in hopes of inspiring you to learn more science and engineering, and also to believe that you can build these projects as well. So, on today's special episode of Back Max Sci, I want to show you how learning more about physics, coding, and electrical engineering helped me to make this device. And special thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. So in order to be able to make a plasma spiral lamp, we need to know what it's made of. And there's four key parts to a plasma spiral lamp. A glass vessel filled with low pressure xenon, a high voltage DC power supply, a magnet, and a enclosure to hold it all together. But unfortunately you can't find item number one super easily just walking around in the neighborhood, stumble upon a xenon uh, lamp. Yeah, no. So we're gonna have to go to the one place I know they make those in Boston, Massachusetts at Stratman Design. And as it turns out, about a year ago, I went to Boston to meet up with the Plasma Toroid Avengers in person and see Wayne Stratman's plasma workshop. Daniel showed us his six liter plasma toroid that he got working. I got to mess with it a little bit. And we also saw some of Wayne's sculptures. And Jeff told us about his home neon studio experiments. And then Wayne mentioned to me, hey Tate, if you like, you could make a video on my plasma spiral lamp. There's lots to be experimented with there. And the adventure began. Our plasma meetup came and went. Wayne assured me he'd whip up a plasma spiral tube for me. And I returned to Los Angeles to an exciting sight. Well, come on in. We got it. So, you got some foam. Ooh. Wow! And a plasma tube! Oh yeah! Check that out. Is that a Ferrari? It's not a Ferrari, it's better. Let's look at what the ends looks like. Okay, we got the lamp. Perfect. Now we need something to power it. We need to generate high voltage electricity in order to generate the plasma inside. A gas can only turn into a plasma if it's given enough energy, and in this case, we're gonna use high voltage electricity to do that. But we need a high voltage direct current power supply. Jeff at the plasma meetup suggested I use a laser power supply. And a laser power supply is a high voltage power supply, which is exactly what we need. So, let's order that uh, power supply. So this is a DC high voltage. So I'm gonna have my friend bring a magnet close to it and see what happens. See if it affects it. <laughs> oh, look, it's all wrapped around the center column of the doer. Ooh. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Can we get it like tingling around? Yeah. It doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. It's because he doesn't like that, I guess. Lens oh. oh. Okay, so we have our plasma spiral tube, we have our high voltage power supply, we have a magnet that clearly affects the plasma streamer in some way, I will tell you how that happens. And so we need our fourth part to the plasma spiral tube, and that is the enclosure, the little box that holds all the stuff together. But uh, how do you design that? And I'm not gonna just stand here and lie and say that I moved on after that last clip and just made the base because I procrastinated for months because I didn't believe I could design something that could hold everything. Eventually I overcame that fear because I realized 
It was just irrational. So don't be afraid of trying something new because usually the hardest part is just starting and then you just push yourself incrementally. And so anyway, that's all to say uh, we need to design the base. Okay, so here's the main part of the enclosure. I call it the base. There's holes for magnets to go in to hold the lid to this base. There's a hole over here for a power cord to go in, 120 volts. And the footprint of the base here is as small as it can be to hold the high voltage DC power supply. It just barely fits in. Uh, there's enough room on the sides for wires to go around it. Uh, there's, it's deep enough to hold the bottom electrode of the xenon lamp. So I'm going to put the potentiometers and the switch here. And here we have the lid. This big extrusion here is going to hold the lamp. It's going to slide in. The electrode goes through this hole. And there's a little inset here where I can put the permanent magnet that needs to go in the center of the plasma tube. There's also this hole right here. That is for the positive high voltage electrode to come out of the box. And last but not least, I also put a verse from the Bible on it. One of my favorites. parts that we need to make a plasma spiral tube. It's that easy, so let's just make it. Just kidding. That's when I found out the high voltage power supply that Jeff suggested I use has an extra feature that's gonna make this plasma spiral lamp unlike anyone that's been made before. I found out it has a power modulation feature, meaning we can change the amount of power it sends to the lamp. This feature is meant to be used in laser cutters to control how powerful the laser is, but who says we can't use this function to be able to dim our lamp like how they dim their laser? The instructions say we can modulate the output power by connecting a potentiometer or a 5 volt pulse width modulated, also known as PWM, signal to these pins on the power supply. Both of these methods supply a voltage to the power supply to control how much power comes out like how you change the position of your thumb over the end of a hose to change how fast the water comes out. With the potentiometer, I could dim the lamp with the turn of a knob, and with a PWM signal, I could do something a little more interesting. A PWM signal, in this case, will act like a digital potentiometer, uh, generating an average voltage that depends on the property of the signal called the duty cycle. The duty cycle is the percentage of time that the signal is in the on state, so as the duty cycle increases, the average voltage increases. And since PWM can be created by code, we can program a custom brightness for our lamp. I'm thinking something random, uh, like this. Or this. Hopefully you catch my drift. So now we need to figure out how to make code do this to my plasma lamp. And luckily, as with most things in life, someone's already done this before. And by this, I mean writing random dimming code. I watched a few videos on YouTube, consulted ChatGPT, and in a day or two, I had my first draft of code that I thought would give me what I was looking for. I uploaded it to my microcontroller, and I chose to use an ESP32 microcontroller because it's smaller than an Arduino, and my friend Dan from the YouTube channel Gears Code and Fire has been able to do a lot with it in his projects. And if I ever want to make this lamp Wi-Fi or Bluetooth enabled, I could. Breaking down the code line by line is a little boring for probably everybody, so let me just break it down like this. I turn on the lamp for a little bit, let the spiral go up, then I change the brightness randomly, wait a random time, and we gotta see if that looks good. Just gotta play with the values. So does the code do what I want it to do? Not exactly. If I'm gonna have any chance of figuring out this code, I'd have to be Brilliant is a website and app where you can learn more science, engineering, math, and programming through thousands of beautiful interactive lessons. I've actively avoided learning programming since middle school because the coding language never made sense to me, but Brilliant breaks down complex fields of study into fun, digestible challenges, providing a strong introduction to any STEM discipline you're interested in. 
And if you use Brilliant a little bit every day, you also develop your problem solving skills. For this project, Brilliant's course called Thinking in Code helped me build my foundation in programming logic. I didn't really know much about how to use loops or conditional statements or how to refer to variables or anything like that. And so thanks to their hands-on activities, which are proven to be six times more effective than watching lecture videos, I quickly got familiar with the programming language and was able to connect the language of the code to the effect that I wanted to make in the plasma spiral tube. So if you enjoy beautiful graphics and learning STEM, try Brilliant for free for the first 30 days by clicking the link in the description, and you'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Unfortunately, watching Back Max Sci can only get you so far. Armed with a better understanding of programming and a circuit schematic, I wired everything together and began experimenting with how I could turn LED dimming code into an undulating plasma spiral. Okay, so I'm noticing that it goes to minimum brightness too often, so I need to reduce the range that the brightness can change for a given cycle. All right, new code just dropped. Let's do it. Three, two, one. <laughs> That's better. So I made the, yeah. Okay, here we go again. I changed the code, so now the changes in brightness should be bigger. Three, two, one. Still not very random. All right, I've changed it again. There should now be a bounce feature so that, so that if the brightness goes too low, then it will set the brightness to max brightness for five seconds to allow the spiral to form again, and then we'll go back to the random dimming cycle. This should allow the lamp to not get stuck in the near off brightness setting. Let's try it. That's the theory at least. Notice that it got really dim and didn't go to full brightness for five seconds, so... Uh... Alright, now I've changed the code so that uh, the lamp just goes through a cycle of fading between fully on and fully off. Fully off. Now it goes to fully on for five seconds and then repeats the cycle. This is more of the aesthetic that I want, the smooth transition between on and off. I think that's the most visually appealing. Now that we have this baseline, let's try to make it more random. And I was able to achieve uh, this effect with code described in this way. Oscillation between two intervals of brightness which is transition between one another for random periods of time. So if I were to make an illustration of that, it would look like this. And you can see how it times with the lamp. Yeah. So I really like how this version has more inertia, sort of, in the brightness of the plasma. And you also don't know when it's going to change. And it's also chill enough to just have running in a room. All right, well, now that this thing works, let's sketch out how to put all of this stuff into this white box. Here's what I'm thinking. So here's the potentiometer to change the brightness in manual mode. And that is the hole for the power switch. That's a power indicator light, dimming mode, or rando mode. And that's a switch to choose between the modes. So it looks like we need to make one, two, three, four. That's good.
the doodad is finished, if I do say my, so myself. Oh yeah. So, how does the plasma spiral tube demonstrate the electromagnetic force? Well, the xenon ions and electrons in the plasma are being pushed on by the magnetic component of the electromagnetic force. To prove that the magnetic force is pushing on the plasma, let's take a look at the plasma tube without the magnet at the bottom. So, what we are looking at is a stream of plasma. It is known that the xenon ions are flowing in generally one direction, from cathode to anode, from top to bottom of my plasma spiral tube. They are moving in a straight line, and there's no curling going on. But, when we put the magnet at the bottom of the tube, the plasma starts to spiral around the magnet because the plasma is now in the magnetic field. And it is simply a fact of the universe that moving charged particles in a magnetic field are pushed orthogonally both to the magnetic field and the direction of current. Yes, it's a weird answer, and it's sort of a half answer, saying that it is the way it is because that's how we see it, but what do you expect from a fundamental force? If the fundamentals can be explained by deeper fundamentals, then the first fundamentals weren't fundamentals at all. Now you could say I could explain this deeper by saying that the magnetic field and the electric field are related by special relativity, but it doesn't really get you much further. But anyway, I can confidently explain why the spiral uh, rises upwards. But this video is already pretty long, so uh, I think I will hold off on that explanation until a future video and give you guys the chance to brainstorm and think about why the plasma still spirals once it leaves the influence of the magnetic field. Uh, the magnet's just at the bottom, it's not all the way through the whole thing, so is the plasma sticking to the inside wall of the glass vessel? Can some sort of argument be made about the shortest ionization path being a spiral somehow? Leave your comments below and let's get a discussion going. Big thanks to Wayne Stratman, of course, the inventor of the plasma spiral tube that you see here today. He spent thousands of hours turning a 19th century novelty into this epic lamp here. Take a look at the predecessor of this lamp. It's nothing like it. But this video is already pretty long and I'd like to dedicate another video to experiments and also maybe asking my professors what they think of the device, what is happening in it, see what they think. So check out Wayne's website in the description and thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in another episode of Back Max Eye. going? Yeah. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> okay. I'm just going to walk into it. You s stay right there. Okay. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, in order to make a plasma spiral lamp, we need to know what it's made of. That's four parts. Okay, read it, read it, read it. <laughs>